Harvard Divinity School. Reorientation and Common Conversation Opening Session, Red Nation Rising from Border Town Violence to Native Liberation, October 19th, 2021. I'm feeling deep gratitude. I bring all of my maternal and paternal ancestors, including my late grandfather, Reverend Marcus Garvey Wood, who transitioned last year, and his mother, Julia Wood. And according to him, she was the daughter of a Native American woman from Virginia. And I bring his paternal grandmother, Susan Wood, who was enslaved in Virginia. I carry them all with me daily in this work. Ashe. Who are you? Who do you bring into the space, the circle? How are you feeling? And where are you calling in from? As you're checking in, sharing who you are and where you're calling in from, we want to thank you all again for joining us and choosing to engage in our community read of this powerful book, Red Nation Rising, From Bordertown Violence to Native Liberation by Nick Estes, Melanie Yazzie, Jennifer Nez Bittendale, and David Correa. Today's conversation will not be directly about the book, so do not worry if you haven't received or read it yet. The session is intended to help lay the foundation for our engagement with this text all throughout the year. Our intention for the year as we move through this book is to honor the call to heal healing our relationship to the land, not just here where Harvard is situated, but wherever you are, and our relationship to the people indigenous to the land. It is a call for us to heal, to examine what decolonization looks like and feels like. Whether you are a descendant of settlers, whether you are indigenous to this land or an immigrant or a descendant of those who were brought here in chains. We haven't determined what this healing will look like, but we will be in relationship with the people who are indigenous to this land as we discern our way forward. We will move respectfully and with humility. And as I help to lead this work in collaboration with my partners throughout our school, I will continue to honor the ancestors and the spirit. Our hope is that this will not be a purely intellectual journey. This work must be re- rerouted in indigeneity. It must remain rooted in indigeneity. Our epistemological framework will include engagement with the ancestral and spiritual realms. As a school of divinity, we will endeavor to lean into other ways of knowing as we engage our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and our spirits in response to what this book is calling us to do and how it is calling us to be. Thank you for being here. And now I invite Dean Hempton, Dean of our school, to share a few words. Thank you, Sadara, for leading us in that um, beautiful and powerful ceremony. And thank you, uh, Steph and Melissa, for your leadership. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the launch of our Common Read program for this academic year. We're very excited for what lies ahead. As you know, last year, we launched our first year-long reorientation and Common Read program, designed to reorient ourselves around our shared HDS values of respect, dignity, mutual understanding, and trust. We spent the year engaging with the text, the little book of race and restorative justice, Black Lives, Healing, and US Social Transformation by Fania Davis, culminating in a wonderful visit from Fania Davis herself. This book allowed us to explore restorative justice as a holistic way to practice our values as we work to build an anti-racist and anti-oppressive Harvard Divinity School. As a result, our Racial Justice and Healing Committee voted to amend our vision to include this intention. So now our vision is to build a restorative, anti-racist and anti-oppressive Harvard Divinity School. This year, we have expanded our reorientation program and have reframed it as the reorientation and common conversation. Our conversation begins today with the launch of our Common Read program, and that will remain our anchor initiative. We're excited to begin our journey of preparation for our reading of Red Nation Rising from Border Town Violence to Native Liberation by Nick Estes, Melanie Yazzie, Jennifer Dennettdale, 
on David Correa. Through our engagement with this text, we will deepen our understanding of structural racism and oppression in this country, which we hope will support our efforts towards advancing structural change within our own institution and beyond, and increase our capacity to engage in difficult conversations, while all the while strengthening our relationships with each other. So thank you so much for joining this effort. We greatly value your participation. So now let the conversation begin. Thank you, Dean Henson. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Ann Browdy, Senior Lecturer on American Religious History and the Director of Women's Studies and Religion Program at Harvard Divinity School. Ann has a long-term interest in the ways that indigenous histories and perspectives challenged the conceptual frameworks of religious studies. And she was recently appointed to serve on the faculty advisory board of the Harvard University Native American Program. She will moderate a conversation between our guests, Philip, Professor Philip Deloria and Anthony Trujillo, that will lay the foundation for our engagement with this text. And welcome. Thank you so much, Melissa, and welcome to everyone in the audience today. It's an honor to be uh, part of the convening of this very important conversation. And I'm grateful to uh, all who have come before me from the original inhabitants up to Melissa's introduction and everyone in between. Um, I'm really delighted to be introducing Philip Deloria and Anthony Trujillo this morning. Uh, Professor Philip Deloria is um, uh, well, I don't know, Phil, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure when I met you. I don't think either of us ever dreamed we would be uh, meeting in, at Harvard University as we are today, and that I would be introducing you as a professor in the history department. Um, but I'm, I, uh, I just want to say to this audience that Phil's work is um, probably best known for his early books in American studies playing Indian and um, Indians in unexpected places. But my very favorite one of his books is his most recent Becoming Mary Sully. Um, Phil is also well known for uh, his editing of the work of his father, the distinguished Native American intellectual, Vine Deloria Jr. But in this book, he lifted up one of his less known ancestors, <clears throat> excuse me, the Dakota artist, Mary Sully, and wrote about uh, her work toward an American Indian abstract, which I had the privilege to teach this semester. Um, uh, for those of us who work in Native American studies at Harvard, there are two periods of Harvard's history. Um, one of them extended for uh, over 350 years up until the year 2018 when Phil joined the faculty. And since 2018, there has been a new era of uh, Native American studies that is blossoming in many directions, including um, attracting wonderful colleagues and graduate students like Anthony Trujillo, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but Phil, uh, I'm going to launch into the conversation with you. I'm going to ask each, and, uh, each of our panelists to say a few words about themselves before uh, telling you what they feel it's most important for the HDS audience to know as we embark on this work. So um, Phil, what I would love to have you tell our audience about is how coming from the lineage of a distinguished Dakota family who have combined commitments to indigenous rights and survival with leadership in a host of arenas in the Episcopal church, in the legal profession and your own work as uh, a university professor and in administrative roles. Um, and I would love to have you tell us how your own work in Native Studies combines all of these different kinds of commitments and concerns. 
Thanks, Anne. Um, thanks so much for, for all the kind words. Um, and thanks to everyone who's who's here. Sadata, um, it's such a pleasure to see you and to join with you in, you know, in ceremony. And um, so I just want to begin by saying how how grateful I am and happy I am to be here as part of this, you know, part of this conversation. And I mean, your question is a is a potentially huge question, right? I mean, it could go on for in a few on. minutes. <laughs> forever and ever but I'll just say a few words and then and we can you know we can we can go from there you know my great great um great grandfather Sasue Francois de Laurier you know had a had a vision that my dad had always interpreted as being a vision about sort of cross-cultural mediation um that would take form particularly um you know through my great great grandfather um or my great grandfather Vine uh, Philip Deloria um, you know, in the form of the Episcopal Church. And so it's interesting, right, in the ways that the family has been a, a kind of institutional family, a family that's been enmeshed in institutions and trying to think about the way that larger change can be driven within the sort of smaller confines of particular places. So, you know, he um, was one of the first people to um, he was a lay reader, he was a catechist, and then he was actually ordained, um, you know, in the Episcopal Church. Um, as was my grandfather, Vine Deloria Sr. And, you know, between the two of them, they were involved in missionary Christianity, but they were also involved in changing and challenging the institutional structures of the church. My grandfather, most notably, you know, ended up in the New York offices in the 1950s during the termination years um, in American Indian country, and he pressed hard on the church to rethink some of those kinds of things um, to the point where you know, there's an apocryphal family story that he once th threatened the presiding bishop on the street in New York City. Um, you know, so the family has had a long tradition, not only of institution building, but of also, you know, uh, militancy, um, you know, uh, some, sometimes more rhetorical than physical. But, um, you know, and then, of course, my dad jumped into the legal profession, um, not really as a lawyer, but as a political thinker around the law. Um, but he was a profoundly institutional guy as well. He had a ton of respect for tribal chairs and, um, you know, tribal, uh, you know, kind of governing authorities. Um, he worked uh, through, you know, three, three and a half really important years directing the National Congress of American Indians. So there's all of these kinds of things, you know, that have happened. For me, it's taken shape really in two different, um, you know, two or, two or three directions. You know, one is just the institution of the university where, you know, I've been a university person from the from the very beginning and thinking about how, you know, change might function, you know, in these, in these places. Um, and within that, you know, a couple of different ways of thinking about it. I, I think the first and probably the most important core sort of way of thinking about it for me is around repatriation and about the ways that the institutions I've been associated with have all been participants in the colonial practice of gathering up and collecting indigenous people, human remains, objects of cultural patrimony, funerary objects, sacred objects. Um, you know, so almost from the very beginning, I've been able to sort of try to work within university institutions, particularly at Michigan and now you know, here at Harvard around repatriation kinds of things. It feels to me like for any institution, that's the beginning point of thinking about responsible, reciprocal kinds of relations going forward and then all other things stem from that. If you have in your possession native things, and you're not thinking about how to return those things, then you actually have no ground to really move, you know, to move forward. So for me, that's always been the beginning. After that, it's always been about students um, and how we nurture and train uh, and support native students and how we educate non-native students to think more critically about, you know, about Native America. And from there, it turns into, you know, institutional kinds of support sort of mechanisms. So, you know, I've been lucky to serve as an associate dean in places where I've been able to actually, you know, make some, some changes and what's really exciting, you know, and as I think you mentioned is um, the fact that we have so much going on at Harvard right now in the space of native and indigenous studies and it's just, you know, incredibly exciting. For me, the second institutional location has really been around museums. Um, as you can tell, there's a bit of overlap between institutions like universities and institutions like museums. Um, but particularly important to me has been my work with the Native American, with the um, you know uh, National Museum of the American Indian in Washington D.C. in New York, um, where I've been a trustee for many many years, chaired the repatriation committee there, but also worked on scholarship and collections, um, you know various forms of tribal outreach, 
um, and thinking about curation and, and exhibition and display and the ways that those things take on educational kinds of, you know, kinds of forms as well. And, and that I think has given me enough grounding to be able to sort of participate and intervene and be in conversation with lots of other museums and particularly smaller kinds of museums. So those are two, you know, I, I think bounded but large locations for thinking about institutional change. It's a place where I've been pretty happy to put some time and, and energy. Well, you've taken on a huge amount. So I'm going to ask you in the short time we have uh, this morning to tell us from your perspective what you think it's most important for students, faculty, and staff at Harvard Divinity School to know about the issues facing Native Americans as we work towards building an anti-racist and anti-oppressive school? You know, so I've been, um, uh, I, I've been I've been putting together a meme, you know, kind of. I mean, actually, been been writing a little song about this. You know, these are the four things. It's the name of the song, and and it's really about the four things that I think we can digest, in all kinds of different variations that Native people usually say to non-Native people. So it's a kind of Native 101 um, kind of thing. So the first thing, we are still here, right? Native people say this all the time. We are still here. We haven't gone away. We haven't been banished. You know, settler colonialism is a real thing, and yet, you know, we have survived, right? So there's a constant, I think, grounding for Native people in terms of pushing back against any sort of sense of marginalization, of tokenization, all of those kinds of things. Native people are autochthonous, um, you know, um, po political, social, and cultural kinds of um, entities and beings. So we're still here. Second thing, um, we're not like the other kids which is to say that um, when we think about the larger landscape of race, ethnicity, um, histories of enslavement, histories of immigration in American history, right? we oftentimes tend to fall back into sort of ideas about racial formation or ethnic identity, those kinds of things. It's really important um, from Native people's perspective to remember and reassert that Native people have a political relationship with the United States government that goes back to the Constitution and before the Constitution even, right, in the form of treaties that produces a relationship, a complicated and sometimes hard relationship to figure out, uh, which requires a trust obligation on the part of the federal government on the one hand, and recognition of indigenous sovereignty, political sovereignty on, on the other hand. And the fact that those two things go together in complicated kinds of ways that are sometimes hard to understand. So that's the second thing, not like the other kids. Um, third thing, we want our stuff back. Um, and of course this speaks to repatriation kinds of things, but I think it also speaks to the questions about what decolonization looks like. How do we think about it? Is it not a metaphor and therefore requires the actual physical return of land? Um, is it a sort of um, a more of a metaphorical or analogical or conceptual kind of thing where we decolonize certain spaces? How do we think about that? The bottom line though, we want our stuff back. And the fourth thing, um, you know, we've got some things to say. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that's been so exciting to me over the last few years has been watching some of the things that my dad, you know, originally proposed, thinking about the intersection of indigenous spirituality and sort of the sort of high gloss physics, <laughs> um, you know, um, and was it possible that we could imagine those things were kind of coming together from different places, but ending up speaking about similar kinds of things about the disaggregation of minds and bodies, about the weird things that happens to electrons when they're put into different kinds of situations, you know, about what the spiritual world, metaphysical and physical world, you know, actually looks like. And what's been really exciting has been to see the ways that biological sciences have sort of started to say things that look like what indigenous people have been saying for a really long time, right? forest is not just the trees, it's entities that communicate with one another, that there are multiple systems and, you know, um, you know, in relationality, you know, to one another. And so as we think about climate crisis and all of these other kinds of things, American multiracial democracy, it's important to know that Native people are not people standing on the sidelines, right? Um, that we have things to say, we have knowledges that are produced, um, and that are continually produced, you know, to this very day, um, you know, so we've, we've got some stuff to say. So those are, and those are the four things, uh, you know, uh, that I think are useful kinds of groundings, a kind of Native 101. That's great. Well, I'm looking forward to the song. 
Um, and that gives us a great place to start. I, I really wanna emphasize the last thing that you said that indigenous knowledge is, uh, has been in development when we wanna learn about the places where we are and about the environment that we live in, this is a resource that goes back way further than European knowledge of this continent um, and that we really need to take very seriously. Um, well, I'm gonna move right on to introducing Anthony and then we're gonna come back to um, a conversation. So thanks so much for your, your comments. Um, Anthony, can I ask you to turn on your camera. Welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Um, as I mentioned, Anthony is one of a very talented group of doctoral students um, that have come to the university in recent years. Uh, before he uh, entered onto doctoral work in our program in American Studies, he completed his master's degree at uh, Yale Divinity School, as well as residing in Mongolia in the Peace Corps. Um, he hails from the Ok Owinga Pueblo in New Mexico. Um, and I want to ask, start out by asking you, Anthony, um, coming from Ok Owinga, um, what has made you focus your graduate studies on Native New England, and particularly on participation in and resistance to Christianity in Native New England. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, and thank you, Professor Brody, for um, the question, for hosting this conversation, for uh, everybody who's uh, been part of this, this really amazing um, opening to this, this the community read, uh, to, to Melissa, to Sadata for that wonderful ceremony. Um, and, you know, I think as I, even just in our opening this morning, I was thinking, you know, why? Why, why is it that I have kind of, um, you know, been drawn to the Native Northeast? You know, I think one, like, one response is to say that, um, you know, my ancestors are, I have uh, relatives who are already here. Um, so one, my uh, great-grandmother uh, was a pot, uh, pottery maker uh, from Ok Winga Pueblo, and one of her pieces is in the Peabody Museum here. And so uh, I didn't discover this until I was, you know, uh, about to matriculate um, as a PhD student. But to know that there have there have been engagements between the Pueblos and the East Coast and the Northeast. Um, for a very, very long time and, uh, you know, spiritual, uh, ceremonial engagements of recognitions of, uh, you know, where, where does our, where does our rain come from um, in, in the Southwest. Um, and up here, you know, there's, we have, there's corn, one of the three sisters, um, which is kind of speaks to the relationship between the, uh, the Southwest and the Northeast. So these are, are not new relationships. Uh, they've been there for a very, very long time. And I feel like I've been kind of um, uh, just learning about that as, I, uh, as I've uh, f become more familiar with, with the native Northeast. Uh, I think on a very practical level, um, uh, yeah, I started my uh, graduate studies uh, at Yale Divinity School. Um, and <clears throat> at that time, I, I actually knew very little about the native nations and the native histories of the Northeast. Uh, my, one of my first classes was a class called Race, Religion, and Theology in North America. And we read a book about uh, native Christianities uh, in the Northeast in the 18th century, uh, the Indian Great Awakening, it was, it was called. Uh, and um, I think what I realized or what I saw in that um, were the, you know, here were these Native people who have been grappling with the same problems and questions that I've been wrestling with uh, for the better part of my life uh, between the relationship, the relationship between Christianity and indigeneity, uh, or even more specifically between uh, Christian indigeneity and settler Christianity. Um, and, you know, so this, you know, these are, you know, several centuries of these kind of trying to figure out what's going on and how do we make sense of these relationships. Um, and, you know, I think for myself coming in as a graduate student, having been out of grad or out of university for about, I think, 15 years at that point, um, I was 
I was definitely intimidated, intimidated about uh, starting a grad program. Uh, but as I started to kind of learn about uh, some of these figures, uh, Samson Occam was one of the people that uh, I actually wrote my first graduate paper about uh, his hymnal in like the late 1700s. I think it's one of the first hymnals published actually here in Boston. Um, and, you know, he was an influential, uh, prolific uh, Mohegan minister. Uh, Mohegan is down um, in current day Connecticut. And that just opened up a whole world to me of native engagement with and challenging, you know, political and spiritual uh, colonial authority and what that looks like uh, in, its very, in its various permutations. Um, so, you know, I think I felt a sense of connection in a, in a way to the types of questions Occam was raising, uh, especially his music and singing and music as a mode uh, for energizing and sustaining uh, his native community. Um, and, you know, I think in a way I also found myself becoming um, a little less anxious and more energized as I researched and wrote, you know, that initial paper. Um, and that's kind of grown as I've done more research and writing about the native Northeast um, and, you know, people including uh, Joseph, jo or, uh, Joseph Johnson, who was Samson Occam's son-in-law, uh, a woman, uh, a native, native preacher, Sally George, and her mentor, Hannah Caleb, William Apes, uh, who some folks here uh, on the call have engaged with in his uh, eulogy on King Philip, uh, which he performed at, here in Boston in like the early 1830s. Uh, and I think what I found as I've just been doing this research in the native Northeast is like this coming together of a community, I think as Sadata so, uh, you know, just you know, rightly put it of people who I, I have found both uh, energizing, uh, but also who have kind of called me to, to think about the stories that are present here in these places and what is, what are, what is my relationship with this place and what are my accountabilities um, with, uh, with these ancestors and with uh, the current uh, native nations of this region. Um, and I think also, you know, one of the big questions that one of uh, my mentors as a um, Div School student, uh, Willie Jennings, you know, used to ask me is like, or advise was to say, you know, follow your energy. And I think that's, that's what I've done um, in, my, in my coursework. Um, and, you know, I think that's just opened up a whole lot of things that I you know, hadn't anticipated in terms of um, you know, seeing, um, you know, the, I would say that there's, there's New England and, there's, North, and there's, there's the native Northeast and those are two simultaneous places that are uh, engaging with each other to this day. Um, and that's kind of been, it's, I think exciting and energizing to kind of figure out what the relationship between those two uh, ways of conceiving of this region uh, have been. Um, yeah, let's stop there. Thank you so much. It's so helpful to just have you reframe our language at the most basic level to speak about the native Northeast rather than speaking about New England. Like what, what are the choices we make even with that very small uh, use of language that refers to such large concepts. So let me give you uh, just the same chance I gave to Phil Anthony to tell this group um, whatever it is you think we would most need to know as we uh, try to understand the indigenous context of this place where we work, study, and teach? You know, I think um, one thing is just that yeah, this work has been going on here for four centuries. Um, I was in a class with uh, Professor uh, Breckus and Professor Holland this past year, and, you know, one of the texts that I came, uh, came across was this uh, native now set man on uh, our vision of a native now set man on Cape Cod of um, having a vision of a colonial authority uh, who was like, demand, like demanding that this now set man and uh, kind of conform to Euro or European modes of you know relating with with this, with spiritual beings and with the place and this man was like you know, no, he, he was not having it, and, he, and it was a dream. And um, 
to see this now set man in like the 1630s arguing in his dream with a colonial figure, you know, you know, these types of things have been going on for centuries. You know, it's there again in the, uh, I mean, you know, there, there has never been an instance in when, when that's, in which that's not happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to, to kind of, I think once we start to think about uh, some of the things that uh, Sadata mentioned, like, you know, who are the store, who does this do these lands and waters, who, whose stories are connected with these? Uh, then we also see like all the petitioning, all the legal struggles, all the spiritual struggles, the uh, ecclesial struggles between indigenous people and, um, you know, various colonial uh, authorities and regimes um, trying to figure out, you know, position ourselves or position, you know, whether here in the Northeast or in other parts of the country uh, in relation to um, other people who are arriving uh, in, uh, as uh, like enslaved Africans, as, uh, as other forms of labor for uh, colonial economies, um, like trying to, we've been engaged in these questions about what are the, how do we relate and create space for ourselves and uh, survive and also thrive in these places. And sometimes that comes out in the form of something like Samson Occam's hymnal, you know, collection of songs that's there to energize and like, um, you know, can really give a community a sense of power of being together just through the you know, collection of voices. Um, sometimes we see that in something like uh, the, you know, the collection that this, um, that, that's, uh, the, um, the common read this year, you know, the Red Nation Rising, you know, these stories that, you know, kind of bring up a lot of anger. Um, but that anger is also rooted in care and, you know, a desire for connection and community um, that is often, you know, challenged and frustrated and, um, you know, so I, th I think to see that you know, something like Occam's hymnal, you know, which can be kind of read as like a generative thing and something like uh, Red Nation Rising, which kind of uh, can evoke a lot of like also strong emotions. These are not in opposition to each other. They're kind of, you know, there's not the like, you know, the the, the noble savage trope and the, um, the you know, um, the violent Indian, you know, there, we're people who are trying to use different modes, different forms, different genre, different registers to maintain our sense of connection with place with the, and um, with each other. It, thank you so much, Anthony. It's, I find it so inspiring, both uh, your invitation to be part of a tradition of resistance and negotiation that has been going on for 400 years and also Sadata's invitation uh, to ask us how we are considering um, the original people in the decisions that we make about how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to say for myself by both you and Sadata, I feel really welcomed into this conversation and I wanna thank you both for that. Now I wanna give um, both you, Anthony and Phil, if you can come back on camera, thank you. Um, I wanna give you a chance to ask each other questions or respond or react to anything that you heard each other say before we open to the audience. And um, we are going to, um, after that, I wanna tell those who are thinking about questions to put in the chat, uh, we will have a chance for questions from the audience. So, um, Phil, do you want to uh, start out with any responses or questions for Anthony? Sure. I mean, you know, Anthony, I would I would love to hear you sort of kind of think or meditate a bit more on the actual sort of functions of music. It's one of the places where you and I first had some of our most interesting conversations where history meets music meets the sort of interests of actually divinity school, because we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, exactly those, you know, kinds of things. And um, we talked about the you know kind of Yale project that you were involved with, with sort of resurrecting old hymns and singing, um, you know, and uh, 
and this is one of the things that's so important, you know, in, in my family's own, you know, church history was the sort of taking of, you know, Christian hymns and the indigenizing of these things in terms of style and performance and the social meaning that came out of them. I mean, it, it's always felt to me like music is one of the things that Native folks have grabbed onto um, and made their own in really powerful ways. And they've done it very quickly and very efficiently and very effectively. And it seems like when you're sort of talking about Sam Samson Ockham and some of these things. So I'm just wondering you know, sort of about how would that shown up, you know, in your own, you know, kind of experience about how, how music uh, and indigenizing kind of ends up working. Yeah, you know, I mean, um... I guess yeah. There's there's a a way of like narrating my own like you know autobiography that's just like different move different movements of uh, musical movements, and I feel like every place that I've that I have been, um, beginning with uh, you know growing up uh, in in the pueblo in New Mexico, um, and you know our feast days and our dances, um, and and you know. Um, the many occasions, you know, where I uh, am even, you know, able to go back um, for those, it's, you know, it's the power of the drum and, you know, just that rhythmic, and it's, and it's a full body expression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that there's the drumming uh, and, uh, and I consider this, a leaf just flew in my mouth. Um, <laughs> you know, whole, whole full body prayer, you know? Um, this is like, you know, uh, the drum becoming this resonating chamber that echoes in the whole, in the whole village, the bodies kind of pounding the ground, the singers like just, you know, with in their loudest like voice and their, you know, greatest, like deepest timbre, um, you know, filling a space, um, you know, it's a, it's a really, really powerful experience. And then, you know, a few years ago when I was um, part of this project at uh, Yale Divinity School uh, with uh, another hymnal, hymn, hymnal collection, it's called uh, Indian Melodies. It's uh, shape notes um, written by, or like collected, I should say, and uh, by a man named um, Thomas Kamuk, who was part of the Brothertown movement in the early 1800s. Um, but anyways, part, part of that singing tradition is to sing, um, you know, four parts singing toward each other. And there's a, a space in the middle where people can go and stand and you just hear the sound coming at you from every direction. And, you know, we're singing these songs that are like, you know, like really you know, you know, thick Christian language. Um, and I just found myself thinking of like, you know, like there's, there's the language we're singing about, um, you know, this heavenly home and so on. But then there's just this sound that's coming out that's also interpreting that song in a really important, you know, material, physical way, like right here and now. And so I think about those things, uh, you know, whether it's you know, something that's more considered traditional uh, or in some a different like transposition of that into, um, you know, native hymn singing, for example. My, you know, my grandfather used to drive around the roads, the back roads of South Dakota with his arm out the window, pounding on the door as his drum, and he would alternate between singing, you know, you know, to native Lakota and Dakota songs and hymns, you know, and, and it was, there was a seamlessness to it, right, and part of the performance was, was to sing it as loud as you possibly could, right, I mean, this was his other thing, like, not subtlety, These, this is a particular kind of form of native singing. Um, super important to him. So I'm I'm curious, uh, Phil, to just hear your thoughts just on you know when we think about um, and we've had this conversation a, a couple times in different uh, forms and ways, but this idea of power, you know, when when we're thinking about when power is um, part of our cover our academic conversations, you know, kind of takes on a really ominous and it can be you know a brutal, violent kind of power, uh, but, you know, something that, you know, I often think about is like power in um, like indigenous communities that have, that has kind of been a generative type of thing and it's, that comes out through music, that comes out through writing. And I'm just curious to hear your reflections on, you know, what, how do you think about power in different forms? And Yeah. 
you know, I mean, you know, Anthony, I, I tend to think, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, I, I, I came up in the, you know, 80s. So I, you know, I, I come out of the Foucauldian tradition of understanding mm -hmm. powers, capillary and all of not true, you know. I mean, it's also, I, I think, the case that when we study indigenous history, we have to think about power as violence, right, and forms of force. And mm -hmm. whether that's actually killing, as it is so often, or whether it is the constant threat of killing, or whether it is the, the threat of disease and dismemberment or removal from your space. I mean, all of these sort of exercises of force are clearly, you know, exercises of power. And What's really interesting, I think, then is the is the flip side of the equation, right? How do Native people think about their own power relative to those exercises of power that are happening? And I think it's one of the things that's really quite interesting. And, and I think I would commend to our audience as we're reading this book. Um, oh, I'm, a, yeah, forget it. The blurry thing makes it. I mean, you know, one of the one of the questions here is sort of like, what is futurity? around these sort of questions and contestings of power, you know, and, and so there are gestures in this book to sort of, um, you know, native exercise of force, you know, as well, right? Um, you know, um, but I think one of the things that the authors of the book sort of caution us against is to sort of think like, no, 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 the desire of the settler state is for native people to try to match force for force, gun for gun, violence for violence, right, with the settler state, which is a, is a contest that native people always lose, right? Um, so that's not where, that's one form of power. It's an important form, but it's not one that's going to carry the day. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a second sense that, that maybe comes out of this book as well, which is the sort of sense that like, you know, a settler structure just can't hold over long, long periods of time. Right. So, you know, I started hearing, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you know, the first iterations of Native folks saying, like, you know, the United States isn't going to last them much longer. Um, you know, 15 years ago, that seemed kind of crazy and untenable. It seems completely within the realm of possibility at the, uh, you know, the present moment. Right. And there's a structural argument about power there, I think, which says, you know, this is actually not tenable over the long term to be in someone else's space. It may look like it's tenable, right? Um, but let's look at over, over the long period of time. So there's a different form of power um, there. Then there's a third thing that I think is super, super important. And it's to me, I think the thing it is gestured at in this book, um, you know, a bit, which is that Native people have also always taken really seriously the idea of spiritual power, right? Um, and the sense that, you know, not necessarily in a, in a sort of, you know, teleological sense, but in the sense that, that there is a real world, you know, out there and that power exists in that world um, and that human beings have certain forms of access to it and that it, it flows and works in ways that are, that are not clear to us and mysterious to us. And, um, you know, um, and that it is, is not wrong, um, you know, for Native folks to access that power in ways that, you um, you know, we, we don't, I don't think necessarily fully understand in which we're open to change and flux. Um, and that the accessing of that power actually um, is going to have something to do with whatever happens in the material world of the future, right? So this is a futurity, I think, that's embedded, you know, um, within that. Wow. I'm speechless um, and humbled. Uh, to think about in indigenous access to power that really exists um, as maybe a larger framework in which we can see the very brief uh, European and African history of North America. Uh, audience, um, you are invited to put questions into the chat for either of our panelists today. I haven't seen any yet. So um, uh, while, oh, maybe into the Q&A box. Okay, I was looking in the wrong place. Um, all right, I'm gonna pose a question from one of our Women's Studies Research Associates, Zad Shamil. Um, she says, thank you to the panelists and organizers for this generative space. I'd like to pose a question uh, to both Melissa and Sadada, um, who are not on screen at the moment, Zot. So I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that. Uh, let me hold that question till that they're back on the screen. 
And let me see if there are questions for uh, Phil and Anthony. Um, and until then, I'm going to go back to the two of you. I know you have a zillion questions for each other. Um, uh, can I ask you to talk about music, Phil, and um, what some of your experiences with music and Indigenous futurity? Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> what's really been interesting to me, you know, of late is the ways that, and I think it maybe goes to Zot's question in, in a way, right? The um, you know, sort of um, emergence of indigenous hip hop artists and the ways in which indigenous music as a young person's thing, I say this as an old person, um, you know, I mean, has been all about sort of engaging on the one hand, sort of ideas about history, right? I mean, how often is indigenous, contemporary indigenous music, you know, fitting into the sort of parameters of pop music? Like not much, right? Because it's about sort of colonialism, and history and pain, you know, kinds of um, these kinds of things. But, you know, in adopting the, you know, the form of hip hop, um, contemporary decolonizing, indigenizing kinds of music, you know, it feels to me opens up this kind of, um, you know, kinds of dialogue um, that we might be thinking about between sort of black cultural production, native cultural production, global cultural you know, kinds of forms of production. So that actually, that comment is the perfect, uh, now that I have Sadata on screen, um, uh, is the perfect way to get back to Zot's question, which is, um, uh, she says, oftentimes discussions of indigeneity allied blackness and indigeneity. And I was thankful that you both foregrounded this, this, this in your comments. Could you comment more on this elision? And I'm gonna ask uh, Sadata if you'd be willing to speak about this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zach, for that question. And thank you, um, Phil, for that kind of transition. Um, I guess what I wanna talk about is the ways in which um, these communities historically have been coexisting. Um, and we understand um, they've been complicated, particularly in the Southeast, um, and to some extent to the Midwest um, by the held slavery of um, enslaved Africans by indigenous people. Um, that's not been the only way that those relationships have been formed. Um, in my tribe in particular, for hundreds of years, we've been both black and native. Um, and that's not, those have not been um, conflicting identities. In fact, um, there's a there's a kind of acknowledgement of a kind of, um, I'll call it like a, a deepening of indigeneity, the, the kind of you know, understanding that enslaved black Africans are indigenous too from other lands. Um, so I wanna lift that up and I wanna lift up you know, the ways in which I think some of the, um, the kind of rub or the, um, I would even say like the relational violence around that that we see um, particularly for Black um, Natives in and outside of their communities, um, is the is the violence of, of white supremacy and colonization, like at work, you know, um, and the ways in which that I think there's still a lot of um, healing that has to happen, um, and a lot of um, understanding ourselves outside of um, the white and the colonial gaze. That if I think if we want to really do that. A liberatory sovereign work. We can't do that um, with a framework or a cosmology of whiteness and colonization. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, those are, I think those are, those are some of the things I want to speak to that in terms of that. Um, and I also, I, I guess I also want to say that I, I think that you know, the anti-blackness within community and outside community is I think something that is a barrier you know, to both kinship and, and people's access to both their, um, their, their full selves, you know, and their relationships. And I think that that's not just something that um, Black Natives need to overcome, but those who are non-Black Natives um, have to work towards as well, that, um, that it really takes both sides to do that uh, courageous work. Thank you. Um, Phil or Anthony, do you want to comment on this issue? 
I mean, this is the fundamental, you know, I think one of the fundamental problems and challenges is how to sort of think through these relationalities, you know, in a decent and honorable way that, you know, is, is, is good. Um, it is worth noting, right, that the conversations about these things in the United States are fundamentally about race. Um, and when we speak fundamentally about race, we oftentimes, I, I would say almost all the time, speak out of a black white racial paradigm um, in which other racial forms of racial for, uh, kinds of kinds of racial formation struggle to get a foothold in that kind of conversation. Um, you know, so indigeneity is a different kind of thing altogether, although indigenous people are also racialized. Um, you know, so I think it's also it's worth noting um, right, that the ways that these two conversations oftentimes sort of like their tendency is to pull apart in different kinds of directions, right? Um, the indigenous conversation is very much um, more about saying like, let's step aside from race for one particular moment and think about political identity, right? And conquest and settler colonialism, right? Um, the African-American and the sort of racial conversation is to say, no, let's think about um, a different kind of thing um, the danger with both of these is that they end up being, you know, reified as first principles, right? And so we see this on the one hand with Afro-pessimism, sort of asserting that, you know, Western enlightenment, the creation and the invention of the liberal subject depended upon a complete and total dehumanization of the African slave, the black slave, right? And that racialized project was the fundamental first principle of thinking about, you know, everything that has gone forward. You get the settler colonial response, which is to say, no, 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 it's all about settlers and, you know, and the indigenous, that's the first principle. This is the fundamental mistake um, that we make in these conversations and we cannot allow that to, to really stand. The people who are thinking through this best, um, I think it, with them in the most honorable way are the ones who are struggling to really put these kinds of histories and these theoretical structures for thinking about them into uh, you know, a mutual and respectful dialogue. Um, but I wouldn't say that any part of that is easy. Thank you, Phil. And that really speaks to um, one of the next questions that's on our agenda from Emma Thomas. She says, I would love to hear your reflections on working with indigeneity decolonization within this bastion of colonial power that is Harvard University. How do you work within this system? How do you protect your own indigeneity? You know, I'll, I'll just jump in. And um, I was kind of, th I was thinking about this um, question, just, you know, with, in relation to, you know, Harvard's uh, founding as, a, as an Indian college, right? And, you know, a, a site for the assimilation or Christianization of, Primarily, I mean, of pretty you know, exclusively native men or native uh, youth uh, males, and you know how the work I think even at that time was to um, how to resist that you know the heteronormativity, the you know, Christian patriarchies that were kind of embedded in the in you know, Harvard as an institution, as, a, as it was founded. Um, and to kind of like, to, to fragment that by our presence here in this place in a way that's, that calls it to be something other and more in, in excess of its founding principle of assimilation and um, colonization. Um, and so I feel like in a way, uh, you know, with every year that, you know, um, yeah, we come, uh, indigenous people, people of color, um, you know, people who are resisting that kind of, uh, that, that framework, we reenact and, re and perform that, that struggle of trying to make, you know, a, an institution that's kind of built around and with edifices, you know, like physical edifices that try to like confine us into ways of modes of thinking, modes of relating, ways of thinking about ourselves, and to, to use these spaces as, um, you know, with our bodies, with the way that we form community in these places. You know, uh, I'm, I also coordinate the uh, Native American Indigenous Studies Working Group here uh, at Harvard, uh, for, uh, and thinking about how you know we're taking you know 
the idea is that how do we make make indigenize these spaces with, just with our presence um, and with the you know you know coming back to things like um, advocating for uh, the repatriation of indigenous you know uh, materials and remains the inclusion of uh, historically excluded uh, uh, bodies. Um, you know, in the space. And so those are some of the things that I think about uh, just as far as like our, our lived practice of what it means to actually move through this place and form community here. I mean, I think Anthony is exactly right about this, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it may be something of a truism, but I think it's a, it's a fair one to say, right? That the act of decolonization is the responsibility of institutions that have colonized. <laughs> Right? It is not the responsibility of indigenous people to decolonize, right? We can make some suggestions, right? But that's, those actions are the undoing of those things are the responsibility of the people who did. Um, what indigenous people do is to indigenize the space. And in some ways, I think, you know, surviving at Harvard and thriving at Harvard is about taking joy in the moments when we can say, oh yeah, and we did it over here and we did it over here and we're doing it over here. So, you know, in some ways, you know, for us, I, I think it's it's safe to say that there's a there's a um, there's a kind of pleasure, frankly, right, in finding these moments of indigenizing spaces that haven't really sort of thought much about that. While the decolonial project is chugging along very slowly, in another way, right, we don't necessarily have to feel like our action or our agency and our responsibility lies with the decolonizing project so much but with the indigenizing project. And then the, when the two come together is when things can actually be beautiful. Uh, that is so beautiful. That is such a beautiful last word for our conversation. Um, I, I, there are many other questions that I would love to ask. I just want to express gratitude to all three of you for everything that you've brought to the table uh, and for really launching Harvard Divinity School on a project that is open to indigenization. So I know this is going to be the first, the first word, not the last of a long process. Colonization has been going on a long time and uh, we're going to be, decolonization is likewise going to be an iterative project that's not going to happen in one conversation or one year or one book or one read, um, but we're going to start. Um, that's it for this group. Melissa, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And am I here? I want I want to before I let you all go. I just want to give Sadala a chance to respond to that particular question, um, particularly given her experience as a student here at Harvard. Um, so Sadala, if you had something you wanted to share, please do. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Phil and Anthony. I I, I thought I couldn't um, say that more. I think you know. So my work um, at Harvard Divinity School was really made possible um, also by the professors who came um, with, in 2018, Phil being one of them. Um, and, you know, I think for me, it was, you know, I think this work of, um, to pick up what Anthony was saying about embodying and, and um, what Phil is saying about re-indigenizing is like really focusing the work on what your particular identity location is to uh, resist this work. And for me, um, it was really about the methodologies and cosmologies um, that were indigenous. Uh, and then how can we curate those in the embodied practices um, such that we can, um, we can have those as part of the ways in which we learn and we teach and we research even, you know? So um, it was really about like really curating that, you know, and, and, and feeling like that was like my focus and my work and uh, partnering with people. And, and also in Anne, you know, and Anne's class was really big in terms of um, bringing in um, the people in the community to actually have those conversations. Um, so that's one. And, and the last thing I would say is like focus, you know, that like, I think that for me, um, I mean, there were many, there was a lot of prayer that also helped me to survive um, Harvard, um, but focus on like, on what your work is and, and really doing it. You know, I think it's easy to get distracted by like big C colonization and little C colonization that's happening at the school. Um, but to really like, um, to use this time now and like the beginning of the pandemic, I remember um, our leader, um, 
putting out this letter and just like reminding us like our ancestors have gone through times like this like like we we have the resources to go through this like this is not that it's not new and not that it's not bad and not even intense you know uh, but we have resources to focus on um, and to use that and not be distracted beautiful thank you thank you a wonderful way to conclude the conversation I'm so grateful to you, Anne, for moderating this discussion, for Phil and Anthony and Sadata, all that you contributed and to our participants in the audience who offered such wonderful questions. Thank you so much. We want to transition now to invite Professor Michelle Sanchez to join us. Uh, Professor Michelle Sanchez, wonderful. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for being here. We, I've been in conversation with Michelle, um, along with other members of our racial justice and Healing Committee, we were in conversation all summer as we were discerning the text for this summer. And she was gracious enough to be open to our idea that she consider exploring uh, the text that we choose as a possibility for inclusion in her syllabus for her course. Um, she's teaching this year, the theories and methods in the study of religion. And um, she welcomed the opportunity to include this, this text. So we want to just give her an opportunity to share her thoughts about the text and why she chose to include it in her syllabus. Professor Sanchez is an associate professor of, of theology at HCS. Her research interests include the Christian movements of reform, and she studies ways of reading theology that are attentive not only to the traditions themselves, but also to how theological writing responds to concrete historical conditions and general human concerns. So as I indicated, she is uh, this text is on her syllabus, so I'm going to just now allow her to share her thoughts about this text. And we welcome you, Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, everybody. It was a real honor to be invited here and to learn. I feel like I'm here as a learner today more than a teacher. Um, although in these remarks, I've been asked to, to function as a bit of a teacher, the teacher of theories and methods. And, and as Melissa said, talk about where this text fits in the course. I've told the students that attending or watching this session is, is the class that covers this text, but I also hope that we get a chance to talk in greater depth about this text because I actually see it as really central to the task of theories and methods. Theories and methods is a place for incoming students to learn about the history of the field of religious studies. Um, we've explored how it came to be that a thing called religion took up a place in the modern university within the political landscape of Europe and the United States primarily. We've explored some of what's happened since then, how certain theories and methods have allowed religious studies scholars to talk to one another and to begin critiquing not only ourselves, but the place that our field has occupied within a kind of global framework. Uh, ask questions like who and what belongs and who and what has been excluded. And of course, the really complicated question of how we, this incoming class, can continue the project of addressing those historical injustices and exclusions. So in some ways, this simply is the task of theories and methods. I've, I've told the students in a general sense that theory is just a fancy word for ideas that help you notice things in the world. Theory helps me notice relationships between people and things and society and power, bodies, texts, and rituals and to notice them in deeper and more surprising ways than I did before. And methods is just a fancy word for developing precise and responsible ways of organizing and presenting the things that I've noticed. Method starts a conversation with other people and it invites critique. Methods test theories by actually making new connections and making me notice even more things. So the boundary between method and theory is always porous. So the early decades of the contemporary study of religion spent a lot of time trying to isolate a thing called religion as an, as an object of scientific study. That is, it tried to answer the question of what is religion? In more recent decades, the study of religion has tended to move in the opposite direction. So I think it's safe to say if the field began with a kind of contraction, with a kind of compiling of data into something like an object called religion, it is now in a state of expansion. Now we spend most of our time with the fuller range of interrogative pronouns, not just what, 
but who, why, when, where, and how. So I asked today in conversation with Red Nation Rising, who is the study of religion? We can't really seem to talk about religion without at least talking about human beings in a more general sense, the things that we love, the things we fear, the ways we become aware, the ways we live together, our society, race, gender, sexuality, historical experience, the ways that our bodies learn, know, and remember, the people we see, and the people we tend to ignore. Why is the study of religion? Why do we care about things in a profound way, not just as people, but even as scholars? What brings us to this task? We can't seem to answer this question without talking about the things that lead us to our cares, to justice, to anxiety, to suffering. What's at stake in the history and diversity of religious things? Why do others care and why do I care? On a basic level, it's hard to separate scholars from practitioners and description from the pursuit of something like justice, a kind of connection, a kind of desire for things to look differently in the future than they have in the past. When is the study of religion? At times, our discipline has struggled to present itself according to the norms of scientific advancement or the basic idea that what we do in a university has to be recognizably progressive and expansive and lead concretely to discovery and innovation and improvement, which is not all bad. But the problem with this is that sometimes this has led to the idea that some religious traditions don't fit that description. They're stuck in the past. They're stuck with an invalid sense of temporality, one that is at odds with modern European settler colonial progress. When we ask the question, when is the study of religion, we are inviting attention to the violence that has been caused and excused by commitment to one vision of time and one vision of history. Where is the study of religion? This question asks us to remember that all of the who's and all of the why's happen in places. Places have material shapes that are connected to material histories. And it matters that an object or a text or a ritual or a narrative came out of a community in diaspora, all spread out, separated from one another. It matters that an object, a text, or a ritual or a narrative came out of exile or enslavement or conquest. How? So before turning to how, I want to shift and name what Red Nation Rising brings to this conversation. Among other things, it presents the concrete historical and ongoing reality of the border town, the logic of the border town, the paradigm of the border town. Border towns are concrete spaces managed by the logic of the settler. The settler manages the who, the why, the when, and the where. In the words of the text, a border town is, quote, many things at once. It is a thing and a relation, a place and a project. As a project, it is cunning in its capacity to make native peoples appear foreign in their own lands." Unquote. Border towns work by naturalizing the humanity, the social infrastructure, the history, the expectations, and the religion of the settler. And in so doing, they perpetually destroy, erase, criminalize, pathologize, and otherwise contain threats to the settlement. The book opens by discussing particular examples of border towns in concrete direct terms and giving us a sense for their power dynamics. Very quickly, the book says that every town is a border town. Every town constantly reperforms the violent managerial logic of the settler. And towards the end, the book states that the United States as a whole is a border town, and so is Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, to name only some large scale spaces. And this poses the questions for us, for the incoming students, and for those of us who have been here one year, two years, five years, 20 years, longer. Is the discipline of religious studies a border town? Is our school a border town? I think it would be irresponsible to fail to acknowledge that our discipline in our school has been and continues to function as a border town. We opened our class talking about the importance of training our imagination to recognize the global frameworks structuring what we do here, 
the flow of money that makes it possible, the networks of knowledge production, networks that have historically flowed from the global north as subject to the global south as object. The border town focalizes that dynamic on the level of institutions, cities, and the movement of nations. Red Nation Rising calls for dismantling the settler logic and the border town structured by that logic. It is a tall order to dismantle a border town. It is not easy. Not only because the border town is as big as our nation, our network of nations, even global hegemony, a word that we've discussed often and defined in our class. The border town also structures our minds, the things that we assume about our what, who, why, when, and where. Whatever the case, religious studies happens in a border town, and this is why we desperately need what Red Nation Rising offers, which is a framework to place the things we do and ask critical questions and make critical interventions in our own practices that either reify or challenge what we assume to be natural and normal. This is why doing religious studies today demands that we become familiar with different ways of being human. And most important, the where's, the when's, the how's that go into that question with the ways that bodies move and imagine and the habits that our bodies form, the relationships that themselves define freedom in a way that no general logic can capture. This is why doing religious studies today demands that we get good at placing ourselves and making our thoughts and hopes accountable to these global frameworks that structure power as we know it to what is and has been. And this is why religious studies today ask us to denaturalize the border town by remembering our communities, our invisible schools, as Mark Jordan put it a few weeks ago, our secret sources, our attachments, and our acute as well as our ambiguous grief. The dismantling won't begin here. It won't begin here because it's already begun, and it's begun with those named by Red Nation Rising, those who are, in the words of the book, exiles from a native future no longer governed by the logic of the border town. So I conclude by asking you, the last of the interrogative pronouns, how can we welcome the dismantling with utmost care, ministerial attention, public articulation, and scholarly rigor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful way for us to move into our closing of the circle. Your comments and your all that you've shared beautifully help us to just solidify this foundation for our community's engagement with this, this compelling provocative text. We want to thank everyone for the atten your attention. And as we prepare to close, we intentionally added extra time so that we did not have to rush away. We wanted to create space for everything to settle into our bodies, for us to breathe and to allow what we've heard, what we've experienced since we began to settle in and metabolize. So I want to just pause and take a moment and guide us through a breath and ask everyone to breathe. If you'd like to close your eyes, please feel comfortable. Do whatever makes you feel comfortable and breathe according to your own pace. As I shared in our opening, this journey is a call for all of us to heal, to examine what decolonization looks like and feels like, whether you are a descendant of settlers, whether you are indigenous to this land or an immigrant or a descendant of those who were brought here in chains. And as Professor Sanchez has shared, this text is calling us to notice. As she asserts, it provokes the question, is the discipline of religious studies a border town? Is our school a border town? These are the questions we'll be grappling with. And we haven't determined yet our course, how we will heal, how we will dismantle, but we will be working together in relationship with the people who are indigenous to this land as we discern our way forward. We will move respectively with humility. And as I said, as I 
help to lead this work in collaboration with my partners throughout the school, I will continue to honor the call of the ancestors and the spirits. And our hope is that we will not allow this to be a purely intellectual journey, but this work will be, continue to be remain rooted in indigeneity. As a school of divinity, we will endeavor to lean in our ways, other ways of knowing as we engage our minds and our hearts, our bodies and spirits in response to what this book is calling us to do and how it's calling us to be, as Siddhartha shared in her opening ceremony. It's calling us to examine our relationship to the land, and to the people of the land, to the earth, to the source. Our common read book last year, Race and Restorative Justice, was a call to ground our work in indigeneity, the restorative justice principles and practices, which are rooted in indigenous wisdom. And we have been leaning into this way in various spaces throughout our community, through our com committees, our new restorative justice leadership com uh, community that we started this year, and other spaces throughout our community where seeds of restoration are being planted. And this book continues to call us to deeper listening to hear what's being said, how we feel in our bodies, and to connect ourselves to each other and to the earth. This book will be challenging. I've already heard from people throughout the campus who've begun the book. It's hard, it's emotionally challenging, there's a lot to grapple with, and that's good. We encourage you to lean into that. And if you need any help processing what you're reading or processing anything that came up today, please feel free to reach out to me or to Assistant Dean Laura Tuak of the Office of Ministry Studies, or to Carrie Maloney, our Chaplain and Director of Religious and Spiritual Life. And stay tuned and attuned to what your own work will be in, in, throughout this journey. We'll be informing the community about the ongoing elements and conversations as the work unfolds, and it will include small group discussions like we held last year. Before we sign off, we're going to transition now to um, the closing ritual. But before we do that, we want to give thanks again to Sudala for opening our session and welcoming us in. To our esteemed panelists, Phil and Anthony and Anne, our moderator, and to Michelle, we thank you all for helping us to ground us in the foundation that we need to begin this journey together. This work is the fruit of the ongoing work of the HDS Racial Justice and Healing Committee and the Standing Committee on Diversity and Inclusion it is supported by the Office of the Dean, including Bernadette Holder, and our Department of Communications, including Christy Welsh in IT. Also, special thanks to Brian Jenkins for the IT support and Allison Harvey. Finally, we offer our deep gratitude to the indigenous people of this land, to the land itself, and to the source. I'll turn things to Steph to close us out. Thank you, Melissa. I'm gonna read the poem, Native Memory by Ensel Elkins. River was my first word after mama. I grew up with the names of rivers on my tongue, the Kusa, the Talapusa, the Black Warrior. The sound of their names is native to me as my own. I walked barefoot along the brow of Lookout Mountain with my father where the little river carves its name through the canyons of sandstone and shale above Shinbone Valley where the Cherokee stood out on those same stones and cast their voices into the canyon below. You are here, a red arrow on the atlas tells me, at the edge of the bluff where young fools have carved their initials into giant oaks and spray painted their names and dates on the canyon rocks, where human history is no more than a layer of stardust, thin as the fingernail of God. What the canyon holds in its hands, an old language spoken into the pines and carried downstream on wind and time, vanishing like footprints in ash. The mountain holds their sorrow in the marrow of its bones. The body remembers the scars of massacres, how the hawk ached to see family after family dragged by the roots from the land of their ancestors. Someone survived to remember beyond the weight of wagons and their thousands of feet cutting a deep trail of grief. Someone survived to tell the story of the sorrow and where they left their homes and how the trees wept to see them go and where they crossed the river and where they whispered a prayer into their grandmother's eyes before she died and where it was along the road they buried her 
and where the oak stood whose roots grew around her bones and where it was that the wild persimmons grow and what it was she last said to her children and which child was to keep her memory alive and which child was to keep the language alive and weave the stories of this journey into song and when were the seasons of singing and what were the stories that go with the seasons that tell how to work and when to pray that tell when to dance and who made the day you are here where bloodlines and rivers are woven together i followed the river until i forgot my name and came here to the mouth of the canyon to swim in the rain and remember this the most indigenous joy i know to wade into the river naked among the moss and stones to drink water from my hands and be alive in the river the river sang you are here a child of stardust and time sponsor hds office of diversity inclusion and belonging copyright 2022 the president and fellows of harvard college